actually, I want to thank the previous speaker who's very nicely leading into some of the things I actually want to talk about. So firstly, just out of interest and quick show of hands, how many of you actually remember these paper phone books that used to sit <laughs> on the shelves? Okay, yeah, and you had to go to them and you had to find them and you had to flip through the various pages till you found the person you wanted and when you found that person you had limited information. Phone number, fax number, an address and a name. And you had to remember the phone number to take it back to your phone because in those days you didn't have a mobile phone to actually make the call. These days we all use these mobile devices and in addition to allowing us to make phone calls they actually allow us to search. We can start typing into a text field and that text field provides us with a shorter and shorter list of possible fits. When we find the right person or the right contact, we have all sorts of additional information. We have not only a phone number, whether it's a mobile or direct line, but we have email addresses. We have web links to websites where they work. We have all this information. If I want to phone them, I just press the button and the phone calls for me. If you upgrade your phone, to a new model, how many of you print it to paper and then re-enter that data manually into your new device? Quick show of hands, does anybody actually do that? No, you don't. You actually move your data from one mobile device to another mobile device. So why aren't we doing that for our owners? We have the technology, we have the knowledge, we have the wherewithal, and yet we still print to paper and give it to our owners. There's an enormous cost associated with this data transfer or lack of data transfer because we dropped paper. In my opinion, paper is dead data. I can't search it, I can't sort it, I can't filter it. It is what it is. It's estimated the cost is something like $4 trillion when we actually dropped paper from construction through to maintenance and operations. So most of the offices or firms, certainly in the Lower Mainland and in North America, are really using Revit as their source BIM data. That's a database at its heart. It's a database and I'm entering information into a database and then I'm querying the database to ask me to give me views, whether those are plans, sections, elevations. Once I have this data, I can start making that data work for me beyond the traditional generation of a 2D view that's going to be printed to paper. We also need to remember whose building is it anyway. We find, or I find when I'm talking to people, but we forget that we're actually on the architecture, engineering and construction side, we're a service industry. We are actually only employed or have work to do because owners need buildings built, extended or renovated. And if we don't hold that in the forefront of our mind and think, well, what is it that they actually want? We're sort of failing. So are we actually listening to what owners are saying? I hear a lot of people say, oh yeah, we did BIM. Yeah, we did BIM on this project. And we gave our owners a Revit model. Well, chances are your owner doesn't have a clue how to use Revit. He hasn't got the software. He's got nobody with a skill set that can use it. And if they do have it, is it actually any easier for him to go to a binder on a wall and look up paper or go and find somebody who can actually open up a Revit model and give him the information? Or we give him fabrication level models. You've got the same issue. Who can access these models? Who can use them? Who can actually get to the data they need to enable them to do the work they need to do? You're giving them digital data or digital documents that they can actually use and search. Can they trust the data you're giving them? Have you actually got any process in place to audit any of this data that's going to be going through to them? And is it actually what they expect or are they actually surprised when they get it at the end? What we find when we actually speak to owners is they actually want a fairly simple interface. They don't really want the design drawings which were designed to enable the construction team to understand how to build the building. They want views of that data that enables them to operate the building. So you're using the same data source, but you're just creating new views of it. And then you're associating all the information to the object. In the same way, everything you know about a person is associated to the name, 
in your mobile device, you're now associating all the information known about an object to the object. So now I'm in a simple point and click <coughs> type scenario. I select the object and I have all the information. I can color it so that I can help people understand the data. If you use color, you help people understand and uptake information 80% faster. That's why we used to highlight in our books at school or underline stuff. It's because you can find it quicker. So what do we need to do if we actually want to get structured data to actually drive a BIM process that's going to give me data that's useful for my owners? Each and every one of you got here today because you interacted with the road system. It didn't matter whether you were in a car, you came on foot, you used a bicycle, you all interacted with that road system. The only reason that you could use that road system at a reasonable risk level is because you could predict the behavior of other people that were using the system. That's held in place because we have rules. It's the rules that actually govern the behavior. And if you start a BIM process without rules in place, or standards or requirements, or however you want to call them, in place to govern how that data is structured and what it's going to be used for, then you're not going to have much luck. If you have an members of a team that are going to say, sorry, we don't like using the built-in parameters in Revit, we're going to use our own parameters. That's the equivalent of me saying, oh, I learned to drive in England, so actually I like driving on the left-hand side of the road, so I'm going to do that. That's going to create some problems. It's going to ramp the risk level way up, and we're going to have problems. So you need to have your team agree at the beginning that they are going to abide by the rules that are going to be imposed. Part of those rules includes level of development or level of detail, and this creates a huge amount of confusion when I talk to people. People say, oh, we had an LOD 300 model that we handed over. I don't actually know what that means, because there isn't enough definition around what that LOD 300 actually is. LOD is comprised of two different components. There's the visual component, what does the geometry actually need to look like? Often that's very high at the beginning because I'm trying to convey a design intent. And it drops off as it goes through because for the owner to understand that that's a light or that's a valve, it doesn't need to be a fabrication level valve for me to know that's what it is. And then you've got the data aspect. The data aspect is the piece I want to focus on. The data aspect is what data do I need associated with that object that's in the model. The visualization piece, the detail piece, actually comes from the gaming industry. And the level 500 is how close an object is to the camera, and it needs very many more polygons. The gaming industry doesn't have a data component to it, but we need a data component to it. That data component is actually the most important piece. It's way more important than the visual piece. Once you get to maintenance and operations, you need the visual piece to understand how to build the building, but I'm talking about maintaining and operating it. So once I get to maintaining and operating, it's the data that's really important. We break it down so that we have, and this is looking at the data aspect, what is the data that the design side is responsible for providing? When are they gonna provide it? Is it a built-in parameter or is it a shared parameter? What's the build side going to provide? And I'm talking about data that would typically be in those paper binders that sit on the shelves and isn't really a lot of use to me. So what are they going to be providing to me? Am I ca collecting that data at contract award? Am I collecting it at shop drawings, at commissioning, or at actually at handover? You want to collect this data during the process when it's actually in play and people are familiar with it rather than months afterwards when everybody's moved on to the next thing. What's the operations piece? What are the operations side actually themselves responsible for providing? They often have their own codes and their own systems. They're the best people to put in that information in. Otherwise, they're telling me and then I'm telling somebody else and then they're putting it in and then the owner has to validate it. So let's get the people who know the information to put the information in. 
A lot of this information is collected into an external database. It's not going into Revit. Every object in the Revit environment has a unique ID. I can extract that unique ID and then I can associate all the other data to that unique ID. I can pull the whole thing together at the end as a consolidated data set and I have everything. Do I want a fabrication level model as an owner? No, I don't. When I buy a car, I'm not interested in all these little bits and pieces or how you actually put it together or assembled it or the sequence in which you assembled it. I'm not interested in that. What I want to know is, what's the warranty? Do I have a warranty that is time-driven or it's distance-driven? Do I have to do anything so that that warranty doesn't become negated because of my actions? What tyres does it have? Where do I put the gas? Where does the water go? That's the sort of information I need. If I need it maintained, I'm going to send it off to somebody else to maintain. Some owners might have the facility to actually maintain it themselves, in which case they'll do it, but an awful lot of owners don't have that capability. So when I give the owner information at the end of the day, what am I giving them? I can actually start sorting this information out to give them views that actually help them understand the information. So in this example, this is just their supply system. It's coloured, everything else has been removed except the building and the relationship. And the document that you see is basically a document that's associated with the object that's selected, which in this case is a diffuser. So it's a very simple point click, I can't change it, I can't damage it, I'm just accessing it and using it. To get to this point, in addition to your level of development, which is really looking at objects on a category basis, I have to look at what objects is it that I actually need to have information associated with. If I have an air handling unit, that might be one object within a Revit environment, but there's all sorts of things within that air handling unit that I actually need to have information associated with because I'm going to have to maintain them. So things like filters and fans. I need to be able to have those. How am I going to handle that in the model environment and how am I going to handle it from a data perspective so that at the end I can select the fan that might be within the air handler and I know it's a child relative to the parent. I know what the relationship is. I can tie it all together. We heard a bit about accuracy. We develop um, a document which we call an accuracy table. And what this accuracy table does is it looks at what is the relationship between the built building and the design model? And how closely do the two need to map each other? If I have a ceiling above an operating theater, then I probably want a laser scan because I want to know exactly what is going on up there. So if I ever have to make any changes, I can prefabricate everything and the operating room is down for the minimum period of time. But if I'm talking about something like lights and I look in this auditorium that we're in, what do I need to know? I need to know how high that light is off the ground because I need to know whether I need one man and a ladder, two men and a ladder, or I actually need to bring in a hoist. If I'm going to bring in a hoist, then I'm going to probably want to change out all the lamps at that one point in time rather than have to bring the hoist in again and again and close the, the room down. So how many lamps have I got in the room? The count is critical. I want an accurate count of what those things are. But when I talk about X and Y, do I really need it? I can walk in the room and I can look up and I can see where they are. So you have to look at all the various objects in a model and you have to apply an accuracy factor to them. How closely does the location have to map between the reality and the model? What is the effort required to keep the two in tandem? because it takes effort to bring the design model up to scratch to the, fact, to the actual built environment, and it's the design model owners want. You also need um, to undertake an exercise of parameter mapping, which is where is the data going to end up in the end system? So if I'm looking at the maintenance and operations system, where is it that that data's got to go? What is the data slot called? And what does that data slot actually equal 
if I move it across into, say, the Revit environment? Or is it actually a data slot that's going to be provided by somebody on the build side? Is it a subtrade that's giving me that information? You have to map out where the data starts, who's responsible for putting that data in, where it's going to reside. Is it residing in the Revit environment? Is it residing in the external database? Who's doing it? When are they doing it? And then you have to audit it. If you can't audit this data, and you can't check that it's actually fit for purpose, then there really is very little point in spending the effort in collecting it all, because you can't trust to move it through if you haven't actually audited it. So when I go back and I look at what you need, you have to have standards or requirements to get this BIM process to work. It's not just about creating a model. You need the rules. Those are the rules. It's like the rules of the road. You go on, you stop on red lights, you go on green lights. You need your LOD and the MPS. The MPS is the time at which data has to be present within that model so that we can actually use it for other processes. That's the data requirements. What data am I after? Do I know, have I specified the data that I'm after? And my focus is data that the owner wants. Not data that you need to build it, but data that the owner wants to maintain and operate the building. It's different. The accuracy table, which maps all the various objects and the accuracy between the actual built physical building and the geometry in the modeled environment. How closely does that geometry have to actually match what's in the built environment? And then the data mapping. Where is this data going to end up and where is it coming from? And finally, you need an agreement between all the parties that they are going to be held accountable for what it is that has been assigned to them. If you can't hold people accountable for the data that you expect them to deliver, then you're going to have trouble downstream. And finally, is it worth actually doing this and undertaking the effort required? Well, if we go back to the beginning when I said it's a $4 trillion loss or cost, and that's from the US, those figures, to lose the data that is inherently available from design and, from design and build and move it across into maintenance and operations, and then we look at life cycle costing, and without putting people and staff into buildings here, we're looking at design costing 2%, we're looking at the build side costing around 18%, and maintenance and operation is 80%. So anything that we can do to actually move that data quickly and effectively across for maintenance and operations is huge. They get data when it's due, at handover, not months and months afterwards when they suddenly take delivery of piles and piles of drawings and stacks and stacks of binders which sit in facility plan rooms. And that's going back to the old phone books. We don't want to give our owners phone books. We want to give them digital information that allows them to easily move this data forwards. And there's questions later. Questions later. <laughs>